Welcome to the NFPA 70E Introduction Training Module. At the end of this module, you will be able to Describe why NFPA 70E was created. Describe electric shock and arc flash. Describe typical main components of an employer electrical safety program. Identify safety boundaries around electrical equipment. Describe requirements for choosing the appropriate personal protective equipment, or PPE. And describe some requirements for electrical equipment and devices, including condition, maintenance, and labeling. The National Fire Protection Association, known as the NFPA, created the 70E standard. NFPA 70E is the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. It is a guide for establishing safe practices for working with or near electrical equipment. Before NFPA 70E, the National Electrical Code created standards for installing electrical equipment but did not discuss working with that equipment. The U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, known as OSHA, also has standards and booklets on electrical safety that are based on NFPA 70 and NFPA 70E. NFPA 70E is updated every three years because the types of equipment and known best practices can change over time. This module will provide an introduction to NFPA 70E and will summarize some of its important safety guidelines. NFPA 70E was created to protect workers from two major electrical hazards, electric shock and arc flash. The next sections will describe these hazards in more detail. Electric shock results when direct contact with an energized component causes electric current to flow through one's body. An electric shock can cause internal burning, cardiac arrest, and even death. In the United States, there are thousands of injuries and hundreds of deaths every year due to electric shock incidents. In energized equipment, Electric current travels in a very controlled, precise path. There are conditions that can cause electricity to divert from its normal path and travel through the air. This energy release instantly superheats the air and any nearby components causing fire and a nearly 40,000 to 1 volumetric increase in the air. This explosion or blast can launch a human body 10 feet or more resulting in lacerations and broken bones. This chain of events is known as an arc flash, also known as an arc blast. The temperature of an arc flash can be as high as 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is more than three times hotter than the surface of the sun. This intense heat can severely burn and even kill you. An arc flash can also cause electrical components to explode, sending out a violent blast of molten metal. Bits of metal can penetrate skin and cause burns. The force from the blast can cause collapsed lungs, broken bones, and permanent hearing damage. An arc flash is not as deadly as an electric shock, but it has the potential to hurt people in a much larger area. People have been seriously injured and killed as far as 20 feet from an arc flash. NFPA 70E requires employers to implement an electrical safety program appropriate to the risk associated with electrical hazards. Administrative controls, such as verification of proper equipment maintenance and installation, alerting techniques, auditing requirements, and training are required. This ensures that an employer has a documented program in place that will protect workers. An electrical safety program will have the following three elements. Program principles. These concern topics such as the way work is done, 
or the priorities of each job. Identifying electrical hazards and reducing the associated risk, including condition and maintenance of equipment. Program controls. These include topics such as controlling hazards or the control of workers, such as training. And program procedures. This includes specific procedures for working with equipment and machines, such as identification of hazards and assessment of the risks of the task, and necessary PPE. NFPA 70E requires employers to include a risk assessment procedure in their electrical safety program. This can be helpful in deciding the protective measures necessary for a particular task. Before work begins that exposes a qualified person to electrical hazards, the employer must identify hazards, assess risks, and implement risk control. NFPA 70E includes detailed information on establishing an electrical hazard risk assessment procedure, including set values, frequency and duration of exposure, as well as likelihood of injury. According to NFPA 70E, a qualified person is one who has demonstrated skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installations, and has received safety training to identify and avoid the hazards involved. Being qualified is something considered on a task-by-task -task basis. A person who is qualified for one electrical task may not be considered qualified for another task. One of the best ways to prevent electrical accidents is through training. Safety training must instruct workers how to identify hazards, assess the risk, and how to avoid those hazards. NFPA 70E requires training not just for qualified people, but also for unqualified people. This is because there are many tasks where workers without electrical experience will be working in areas that have electrical hazards. These people, even though they're unqualified, must still be educated about the potential hazards. The employer is responsible for making sure workers are properly trained for the jobs they will perform. Employees are responsible for implementing that training when they work. The employer is also responsible for briefing employees before performing a new electrical job. The person in charge of the job briefing must cover the following. Hazards associated with the job. Procedures involved. Special precautions. Energy source controls. And PPE requirements. If the job is repetitive or routine, Briefings may not be necessary before every task, as long as the workers know the relevant information. If a routine job changes in any significant way that could affect safety, then a new job briefing is required. On some projects, there may be host employers who are in charge of the facility where work is being done, and contract employers who are in charge of the third-party contractors working on the host site. In these multi-employer situations, worker training can be the responsibility of both the host employer and the contract employer. In the event of a safety violation or accident, it is possible that multiple employers will be held responsible if it is determined that insufficient training was a contributing factor. Two boundaries in NFPA 70E define different levels of electric shock hazard danger around live electrical equipment. The distance of the boundaries from the equipment is calculated based on its voltage. The boundaries are the limited approach boundary. To work within this boundary, a worker must be considered qualified by the facility to perform the required task. Personal protective equipment, 
or PPE may be required, but shock protection is not required. The restricted approach boundary. This boundary is closer to energized parts, so there is a greater risk of electric shock to workers. Only qualified persons may work within this boundary, and shock protection is required. In addition to the boundaries for electric shock hazards, there is also a boundary for arc flash hazards, known as the flash protection boundary. This boundary is determined by the distance where it is possible to receive second-degree burns if an arc flash were to occur. For high-voltage equipment, it can be as far as 20 feet away. For low-voltage equipment, this boundary can be as near as a few inches. To cross the flash protection boundary and any of the shock hazard boundaries, a worker must be authorized by the equipment owner and be wearing the proper PPE for the job they are doing. Employers are responsible for choosing the PPE for a specific task and for teaching workers how to use it. There are many types of PPE used to protect against the hazards presented by electrical equipment. PPE designed to protect you from electrical and flame hazards may not be made to withstand arc flash hazards. If there is an arc flash hazard, the PPE must be arc rated. Some examples of electrical PPE are an arc rated face shield, safety glasses, a voltage rated hard hat, leather gloves, insulated leather shoes or boots, hearing protection, and a full arc flash suit. NFPA 70E includes hazard risk categories as a way of determining the arc flash danger at a specific distance from energized equipment. The hazard risk categories are based on incident energy. Incident energy is the amount of heat that a surface area would be exposed to if an arc flash occurred. Incident energy is measured in calories per square centimeter. The categories range from level 1 for up to 4 calories per square centimeter, to level 4, for 40 or more calories per square centimeter. As you get closer to live equipment, the potential incident energy increases, and therefore the risk level also increases. The hazard risk categories can be used to determine the PPE required for specific jobs. The higher the risk category, the higher rated the PPE must be. NFPA 70E includes task-based and equipment-based tables as another way to determine when arc flash PPE is required. The tables are based on the task and equipment condition. Either the incident energy analysis method or the arc flash PPE category method can be used on the same equipment for selecting PPE but not both. It is important to remember that the equipment must have been installed and maintained properly and be operating normally with no sign of impending failure. If the equipment does not meet these guidelines, then wear ARC rated PPE, regardless of which method was used. Workers are encouraged to wear appropriate PPE and clothing whenever he or she feels it is needed even if the tables or hazard risk categories do not indicate its necessity. When determining the level of PPE for working around electrical equipment, NFPA 70E provides the following definitions. Properly installed and maintained means that the equipment was installed and maintained according to industry codes and standards, and the manufacturer's recommendations. The equipment owner is responsible for equipment maintenance and documentation, including maintenance information labels on the equipment. Details on this can be obtained from NFPA 70B, Recommended Practice for Electrical Maintenance, and 
Signs of impending equipment failure include items like visible damage or deterioration, overheating, or loose or restrained parts. NFPA 70E clarifies equipment labeling for equipment that is likely to require worker maintenance while energized. These labels must be updated if there are any changes to the equipment. The labels alert the field worker to nominal system voltage, arc flash boundaries, and one of the following, incident energy and working distance, minimum arc rating of clothing, site-specific PPE level and PPE category. NFPA 70E also contains information about working on energized electrical equipment, such as when it is allowed and when an energized electrical work permit is required. NFPA 70E also provides requirements for instruments used for testing. These instruments are required to be rated for the circuits and equipment they will connect to, designed appropriately, considering their environment and use, visually inspected before they are used, repaired, when needed, by a qualified person, and verified as operational. There are a few requirements for portable electric equipment, which includes their cords, plugs, and any extension cords. All portable equipment is required to be handled and stored appropriately, grounded when necessary, visually inspected for damage, defects, or alteration before use, operated according to manufacturer's instructions and safety warnings, and provided with a ground fault circuit interrupter, or GFCI, where appropriate. Conductors and electrical devices are designed to handle a certain amount of current. Exceeding this current can result in overheating or component failure, which can result in an electric shock or a fire. Overcurrent protection devices prevent these hazards by opening the circuit to stop electricity from flowing when the rated current is exceeded. It is critical that overcurrent devices should never be modified or disabled and should always be properly maintained. NFPA 70E is known as the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. In this introduction module, you have learned about some of the important safety guidelines included in the NFPA 70E. NFPA 70E is updated frequently and contains much more in-depth guidelines. For further information about NFPA 70E guidelines, visit the NFPA website, consult the full 70E document, or talk to your supervisor.